Hello and welcome to The Real USA. Today we're in Alexandria, Virginia, a small town along the Potomac River just outside of Washington, D.C. We thank you for your interest in the program and in these stories brought to you from the United States and told in a way that only Telesur could do. I'm Alexandra Hall. As you watch the program, I invite you to share your comments and suggestions via our Twitter at Telesur English. After two police officers avoided indictment in the deaths of unarmed African Americans Michael Brown and Eric Garner, demonstrations broke out all across the United States. Now months later, protesters are demanding a reform of the grand jury system. Our reporter Nick Harper has the story from New York. What do we want? Justice. When do we want it? Yeah. Across America, anger is growing. There's a rising feeling of injustice. Shut it down! Shut it down! In two separate cases, one in Ferguson, Missouri, the other in New York City, grand juries decided not to prosecute white police officers for the deaths of unarmed black civilians. 18-year-old Michael Brown was shot in Ferguson. His death and the subsequent grand jury decision sparked some of the worst race riots in the U.S. for several decades. And now the Justice Department has said the officer who killed Brown, Darren Wilson, will not face civil rights charges either. Eric Garner was detained in New York by an officer using an illegal chokehold. For several weeks, thousands of people have spilled onto New York streets to campaign against what they see as police brutality and an ineffective legal system. I think this is a fundamental breakdown of law and order if people don't know whether or not they're going to be randomly killed. And it's hard to know where any of this will go because you have militarized police, you have a president that's sort of like a lost soul, you have a, uh, a, a grand jury system that's acting as though it's a trial system where no one ever goes to trial. So you have these, all these things going on that just can't be reversed overnight. In the nation's capital, there have been similar scenes and a similar sense of anger. We want to get 10,000, then 20,000, 50,000, then a million people out. He wasn't indicted, even though there were seven witnesses to say he shot uh, Mike Brown with his hands up. So we out here to demand, you know, justice for not just Mike Brown, but all these African people that happen, you know, to get killed by the police. You reach for something, you're going to be f***ing dead. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. And there have been protests in New Jersey following the killing of Jermaine Reed, an unarmed black man shot by police as he got out of his car, seemingly with his hands up. His shooting filmed by the police car dashboard camera. The US is one of the few countries in the world to still have grand juries. They're made up of a group of citizens who decide if there's enough evidence to justify a trial and whether criminal charges should be brought. But as the proceedings happen behind closed doors, some question the secrecy of the system. Criminal attorney Bob Bloom is calling for change. He feels the grand jury system is outdated and doesn't deliver justice. One of the problems with the grand jury system that you saw in Ferguson and the one in New York City um, was that it wasn't transparent. Uh, the grand juries are secretive uh, bodies, um, and citizens didn't get to see what happened. Bloom fills the civilian witnesses in the Ferguson case were differently and unfairly treated compared to the police officers. The cross-examination of the police officers was non-existent, whereas everybody who testified in the Ferguson grand jury that the, that the person had his hands raised, they were heavily cross-examined. Whereas the people who said his hands weren't raised, they were hardly cross-examined. So you can see how the, the system was distorted. A team of FBI agents is now looking into the decision not to indict the officer responsible for Garner's death. While the accidental killing of another black civilian, Akai Gurley, in New York City, will be investigated by a grand jury in the coming months. Nick Harper for Telesaur, New York. In New York, demonstrations against racism and police brutality continue. Meanwhile, a conflict between New York Mayor Bill de Blasio and the city's police has added to the tension. Standing up, fighting back, and talking about how we really 
End this shit! NYPD and New York authorities remain at odds over the control of demonstrations against police brutality. Regardless of the situation, New Yorkers continue to take to the streets to demand justice. The public is clear that we want justice for families in this city who have lost loved ones to senseless police violence. According to some activists, these demonstrations led discontent among NYPD officers over a lack of support of Mayor Bill de Blasio, with many police officers staging silent protests after Eric Garner's death. I think Mayor de Blasio has reacted correctly. I think the people that have reacted incorrectly is the head of the Police Benevolent Association because he has shown that he doesn't care about black and Latino residents in the city of New York. He has demonstrated an uncaring, unsensitive attitude. In the past, there were high fine rates in Harlem, Bronx and Brooklyn due to minor crimes. Now, people from these areas say there has been a reduction in police control. What they say is a strategy. What they say is a strategy to shut down I, I think the, the, the strike uh, shows further uh, distrust and, and, and tension between between the community and the, and the policing departments, I think that uh, the, it just it, it doesn't adjust the problem. It doesn't adjust the concerns of the people. Uh, it doesn't help this situation in, in any way move forward. I, I think what we need to do is have uh, real substantive conversations on, on, on how to move forward in the city in terms of social justice. Regardless of the situation, they say they are organized and that they will continue fighting. Coming together as a community, all different people with different goals in mind, I think coming together is how we're going to start this process. So today, that's what I demand to see. I want to see the start of a change. Police unions deny they went on a sit-down strike, even when Police Commissioner William Bratton publicly announced that arrests have plummeted in more than 70 detention centers around the city. Karina Cartagena, Telesur, Nueva York. In 2013, the Boston Marathon bombing left three people dead and over 200 seriously injured. Nearly two years later, the accused Jokar Sarniev is now on trial and will likely face the death penalty. Patrice Howard has the story. Jokar Zarnayev stands accused of carrying out one of the worst terrorist attacks on American soil. The homemade explosives he and his late older brother Tamerlan dropped at the finish line of the 2013 Boston Marathon changed the lives of runners, spectators, and their loved ones in an instant. Now the people of Boston will be called to decide their alleged attacker's fate, as Zarnayev is standing trial in the city he allegedly bombed at this courthouse just miles from the finish line. Many wonder if a city that showed strength in the face of terror can now be fair in the interest of justice. I think it's not going to be easy to find totally impartial jurors. Uh, the judge is very aware of that. Boston criminal attorney Bob Bloom says selecting an impartial jury will take time. As District Judge George O'Toole is charged with finding 12 unbiased jurors and six alternates, who can also decide if the death penalty is a punishment that fits the crimes. The original jury pool will have approximately 1,200 people from eastern Massachusetts, and uh, the judge will ask extensive questions of that pool and determine if anybody has made up their mind before they actually sit. Jury selection in this case has been particularly important. The judge said he was looking for fair and impartial local residents to serve on the jury, a task that could be a challenge in the very city where the crimes were committed. Sarnayev's defense teams have twice asked but been denied permission to move the trial out of town. Other cases deemed too high profile have been moved out of state, like Oklahoma bomber Timothy McVeigh, who was tried in Colorado. There have been protests against hearing the case in Boston. Do you think a fair trial is possible? Um, it should be. However, that's kind of in the hands of the American public at this point. I feel like their perception is a lot of it. Whether or not a fair jury can be found is a lot of it, and that's, that's going to have to do with the public. But culture professor Salvatore Felica feels the extensive coverage the bombing received will make finding jurors with no prior knowledge of the case almost impossible. No one can possibly be um, unaware 
of what's been going on. The immense publicity that can be generated in this culture, um, a jury pool will definitely be, you know, polluted. And many Bostonians are unsure if Tsarnaev should face the death penalty. I think they'll probably be in opposition of what I think. I think they'll probably not want the death penalty sought for him. You know, just because he killed someone, I don't think that necessarily killing him is the right answer, an eye for an eye kind of a thing I don't generally agree with. The Boston Marathon attacks will forever be a part of Boston's story. And despite mixed emotions, this trial will be a chance for those affected to decide how this chapter ends. Patrice Howard, Telesor, Boston. For some survivors and local residents, the Boston Marathon bombing trial is an opportunity for justice. But for others, revisiting the events on that day in 2013 is like reliving a painful past. The events of April 15, 2013 will be forever ingrained in the minds of Bostonians. When two bombs planted at the finish line of their beloved marathon went off, killing three and injuring hundreds. Nearly two years have passed since that fateful day, but for many in this city, time has not healed all wounds. With the federal trial against alleged bomber Zhokar Zernayev underway in Boston, the city is once again reflecting on the events of that Marathon Monday. Some residents say they'd rather not relive the tragedy, but Mark Fucarelli, one of 17 people to lose a limb in the bombing, said he will show up to court often, hoping to see justice for the crime that changed his life. What are your feelings about having to relive it all in the trial? Uh, relive it, I still live it and I live it every day. What adds insult to injury for many Bostonians is the fact that the alleged bomber in this case was in many ways one of their own. Tsarnaev was born in Kyrgyzstan but grew up in the Boston suburb of Cambridge, located just miles from the finish line of the Boston Marathon. Tsarnaev came to the U.S. in 2002 and became an American citizen, as did his late brother Tamerlan, also a suspect in the bombing who was killed in a shootout with police days after the incident. The brothers called the city home for more than a decade, attending this prep school in town, hanging with friends on these streets, and taking up residence in a quiet Cambridge neighborhood. Chinese exchange student Lingzi Liu also called Boston home, but she was killed in the attack. Her friend says the trial will be tough to watch. Oh, we will have like complex emotion towards this person. You have to view him as a human, um, but at the same time, you, you know what he has done and you just, um, it reminds me of a lot of bad things, yeah. On the streets of Boston, many are still unsure if they'll follow the trial. If it's all over the news and everything, I'm sure that it's going to be a difficult moment for everyone. It's going to be difficult. Everyone's going to be following it um, and, you know, it's it's going to be difficult to follow, but it's going to be a good thing to do, in my opinion. You know, get this over with, get it in the past, and start start on it. You know, what was unique about this event was that, you know, Boston has a lot of pride, and um, they were able to really rally together and and heal together from this event. And I think that we wouldn't have it any other way. Not having it in Boston it just wouldn't seem right. So I think, and I mean, it's going to be painful, of course, to relive something so traumatic. But um, I think. Who could handle it better than, than the citizens of Boston? Twelve of Boston's own will be called to federal court to serve as jurors in the case, while the rest of the city looks on. While some find it difficult to utter the name of the young man who allegedly turned on his hometown, many of those who survived the attack see this trial as a chance for closure. Patrice Howard, Telesor, Boston. A recent decrease in oil prices has also brought down the price of gas here in the United States, a situation welcomed by consumers at the pump. However, Americans who work for oil and gas companies worry that if energy is no longer profitable, they could lose their jobs. Our correspondent Mary McCarthy has the story in Denver. I'm pulling up an order that I received uh, late last night 
for a hot run to a hospital in the western part of Colorado. Vern Mosley recently opened his own shipping business. Business has been going very good. We technically opened doors on October the 1st and we've almost hit the $10,000 mark and we expect to hit that next week. So we're very excited about our growth. He says that since he got started, gas prices have dropped 75 cents per gallon or nearly 20 percent. Every 10 percent reduction in gas costs or in uh, fuel costs actually adds about 4.8 percent to our net profit bottom line. And what that means to us is that we'll be able to expand quicker. The savings are across the board in overall costs for businesses and for individuals when they fill up their tanks. For Colorado, for the United States, this is a boom because imagine uh, you were paying, say, roughly $4, now you're under $3. Uh, you have a 40 gallon or 25 water tank. You can do the math, you can see the savings are tremendous. That savings, five up to $800 that I may have read somewhere, that is going to go to spending on, say, restaurants or some, some other items in the economy. So that's a huge boost for the economy. But there are fears that what's a boom for some could be a bust for others. Here in Colorado, tens of thousands of people work in the oil industry, and some say they fear the lower gas prices could lead to job layoffs. That we have instability in the market right now. We don't know where prices are going, and that makes investing in oil and gas properties, and um, when companies deploy capital, it makes it a tough decision in terms of how to move forward. Um, usually the industry does better when at least we know what the prices are going to look like. The dropping prices are attributed largely to a glut in the market brought about by new oil drilling in the U.S. Using the technique called hydraulic fracturing or fracking that makes it possible to reach previously inaccessible sources of oil. 95 percent or if not nearly 100 percent of wells are hydraulically fractured. Fracking had already become embattled with some cities and counties banning it for its allegedly adverse effects on the environment. Now people who work in fracking are worried about another threat, that the lower oil prices could lead to a major slowdown in their industry. Meanwhile, small business owners like Vern are simply making the most of the cheap gas. Today, he is heading off with a shipment to be delivered deep into the Rocky Mountains. That's about a six-hour round-trip run, so that'll be a full tank. Experts say that when oil prices drop this quickly, they often snap back, making it hard to predict what, if any, long-term effects the lower price at the pump will have here in Colorado and across the U.S. Mary McCarthy for Teleser, Denver. After more than three years of protesting, New Yorkers recently won a victory when fracking was banned in the state of New York. Now activists aim to bring their campaign nationwide and warn other residents of other states about the dangers that fracking could pose to health and public safety. Representatives from more than 40 environmental organizations went to the city of Albany, capital of New York, to express their support for a ban on fracking put in place by Governor Andrew Cuomo. The bill isn't putting the vision out there that we really need if we're going to take this world forward and have a place that's livable for our kids and our grandkids. So we have a lot of hard work to do. Fracking remains one of the most controversial issues for public debate in New York. It was banned after a report by the health department. In the early days, and with a threat to the climate itself, it showed health effects, especially for pregnant women and infants, our most vulnerable members of our population. Desde hace más de dos años, muchas de estas personas... For more than two years, these people have been fighting for a ban on fracking in New York. Now they have achieved their goal, they say they have to take the debate nationwide so this method is not used in other states of the county. Where everyday people like you and I decided enough is enough. And we would do everything in our power to stop this corrupt and criminal industry from destroying the places that we love. 
Representatives from the oil and gas industry criticize this decision, claiming that it will eliminate thousands of potential jobs and hundreds of thousands of in, in income. Claiming that it will eliminate thousands of potential jobs and hundreds of thousands in income. However, New Yorkers have stated in various opportunities that fracking threatens public health. Meanwhile, states like Texas and Pennsylvania are witnessing a boom in fracking. Karina Cartagena, Telesur, Nueva York. Well, that's all for today's The Real USA. Don't forget, you can always send us your comments and suggestions via our Twitter at Telesur English. I'm Alexandra Hall. See you next time.